Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome CEO and President Booking Holdings Glenn Fogel in discussion with Skift Executive Editor, Founding Editor Dennis Schall. Good morning, New York. Glenn, thanks for being here. Wanted to give you a reminder, reminder please put your questions in uh, slido.com or the SCIF forum app, so you, we'll get to them at the end. So, like the artist formerly known as Prince, rest in peace, Prince, the Priceline Group changed its name this year to Booking Holdings. Uh, there's been a lot of really interesting things going on. Um, just to bring you up to date, the company appears to be doing very well. The stock price is down a little bit. It, it went over uh, $2,200 a share this year. If you want to uh, spend your whole uh, yearly salary uh, on something, go buy 20 or 25 shares of Priceline stock. Um, but the company's doing well. So um, profits rose 35% in the uh, second quarter. Revenue was up 20%. But you're only projecting uh, 6 to 9% room night growth uh, in the second quarter. So the online travel market is very competitive. Is the bloom off the rose or the, the glory days of 25% uh, room night growth uh, a thing of the past? Well, there are a couple things to talk there in, in that <laughs> question. Let's start with um, you, what you, we, that 6 to 9% you gave is what we gave as guidance for room night growth. And one of the things I try and tell people to focus on is the long term and not the short term. And I know how Wall Street works. I was on Wall Street for you know, a very long time. But for us, it's looking at the long term future of our industry and where are we in that process. And um, many years ago, I used an American term and I could see, because we're a very international company, and everybody looked at me strangely, and I said, we're in the early innings. And they're like, what are you talking about, innings? But the truth of the matter is, this is still a very early stage of, is a true revolution of how you travel, and how you buy travel, and how you do things. We always talk about how we are a single digit market share company. There is so much left for us, but for all the people who are doing things digitally, online, using technology to transform what was an analog world into a digital world. And we're gonna make it so much easier, so much better, that 10 years from now, I believe what you see today will be significantly different. It's really tough to concentrate on the long term as a public company, though. It's not easy. Yeah. You have to be able to convince the investors that you're doing the right thing and making the right investments. At the same time, look, I don't think any of us are going to sneeze at the, uh, the, the revenue numbers that we put out in the last quarter and what we put out on the bottom line. I think people are pretty pleased with that. It's always a balance. You need to produce appropriate returns in the short term, and you also need to make the right investments for the long term. I agree. It's not easy. Before we get into more nitty-gritty details about the company, let's talk about the world. We're seeing a, you know, a global trend. You know, your company is very much a global company. We're seeing a global trend towards closed borders, uh, anti-refugee sentiment, autocratic governments. How does this impact the travel industry? How does it impact your company? So we always say our mission is to help people experience the world. We want more people to travel throughout the world and enjoy the pleasure of meeting different people, different cultures. Uh, for myself and my family, some of the best experiences we've had has been tra have been traveling. Um, but I recognize there are changes happening about the world, and it's happening at a very rapid pace, which is very, very upsetting to a lot of people. So we have technology changes, make people very nervous about their future, their jobs. Is my job going to be automated away? One thing. You have changes, too, in terms of people who are having a bad life, and whether it's war, uh, whether it's political crises, whether it's a climate change that has ruined their crops and they need to go somewhere else. And they see, oh, if I go to this other place, it's better there. And who doesn't want to make things better for their family? Uh, my grandparents left uh, Eastern Europe because of uh, terrible, terrible problems they were having there. 
and they went to America because America was a great place. And they said, it may not be great for them making that move themselves, but they knew it would be, they weren't sure about it would be good for them, but they knew it would be better for their children. And who wouldn't want to do things that are better for their children? But at the same time, we have the issue where people are moving to is that, wait, we have a tremendous number of people coming in here. Maybe they don't have skills. They don't have, what's going to help my job and all the upset. All these things coming together, and then you have politicians who use this rhetoric to get votes in a democratic place or just want to build up support in blaming somebody else. Now, you can blame technology for some of this, and, but blaming technology is, a, a, technology is an amorphous thing. But if you can blame a person or a group, well, now you can start causing all sorts of things to try and build yourself up. It's a terrible situation going on around the world when you see this and in so many places. Our job is to help lower that by getting people traveling and seeing things. When you spend time with other people and you get to know them, I think that lowers that fear of the other person. And that's our job. Absolutely. So you're, you're nearing your second year uh, as CEO. And I remember in the run-up to uh, you know, who's going to be the new you know, Booking Holdings or Priceline Group CEO, pe people were you know, talking you up and saying you know, this is, there's going to be a lot of continuity and Wall Street will, will love this. But you've actually um, made a lot of st strategy changes, which you know, I think we'll get into. One of them, you know, and, uh, a head-scratching one, was you know, uh, Booking.com grew up uh, Booking Holdings grew up to be a $93 billion company based on largely on search engine marketing. Now, all of a sudden, you say you want to reduce your uh, reliance on search engine marketing, and your marketing spend has actually slowed uh, in relation to revenue growth. So what's going on? So one of the things that we like to pride ourselves on is being able to adapt and change and not do things the way they're always done just because that's how we always did it. That, that's a real uh, bad way to go down the path to ruin because the situations change, and I'll, I'll give you uh, some examples. Certain parts of the world, pay for performance is not the way people are finding ways to buy things. Let's give the, busy, the easiest, biggest example. Google's not in China. So to say we want to be, in, be big in China and try and say, oh, we'll just use Google to get customers, that really wouldn't work so well, right? In addition, we also talk about how we think it's very important that we continue to build out our direct business. We want people to come to us directly as much as possible. And part of the way to do that is build up that brand marketing so people understand who we are, what we are, and have them come directly to us, stay with us. That lowers our marketing costs significantly, and I think also helps us build a better relationship with that customer long term. And you say about 50% of customers come to you direct already. The, the, what the term used was we roughly 50% was what was used. Right. Uh, one interesting thing is you say that you know you want to um, put more emphasis into brand marketing, whether it's TV or WeChat or whatever. But you said recently that um, it's been going slower than you expected. So tell us what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, wh what is the difficulty? I can imagine there was a you know a, a cultural revolt in in you know you're, you've been known for A/B testing and performance marketing. And here, now you want to do more TV. So why has that been a slower go than you thought? So it's interesting they actually go together, because we do have a testing um, ethos. Our DNA is test, 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 test. And if things aren't going well, you don't do it. So, or if things are taking longer to get done, you just don't, well, let's just throw the money at it anyway and don't worry about doing the testing. That's not the right way to go. Yes, I said we wanted to spend more money than we've done so far, but I'm also very happy that we're not a company that say, ah, oh, what the heck, just spend a couple more million dollars. We are very, very frugal uh, executives. We do not want to waste. So better to take more time to get it right than rush and do something wrong. Is it a matter of the ad quality not being good? There are many things that went through, and um, I can give a whole list of them. Everything from small things like working with partners 
in online video where some of the testing tools may not have been ready to things of getting uh, some of the execution on some of the um, brand campaigns. Now, there are many different things that happen into or not uh, liking the way the results were coming in for some of the initial stuff we put out. Um, all different reasons. But again, short term, long term. Think long term. Don't worry, oh, it took a couple more weeks or months for them to spend this amount of money. That is irrelevant. And I, again, I go back to my Wall Street days. It was, you know, you'd see uh, people, portfolio managers, and everybody, all they cared about was, you know, the next quarter or the next week or the next day, day trading people. I mean, come on. That is not the way to build a lasting franchise. The way to build a lasting franchise to build value for your customers. And if it takes you a little bit more time to do the right thing, spend the time. I hear you. Glenn, you seem to be a personal, uh, a pretty affable guy, but when it comes to MetaSearch, you've been playing pretty rough with some of the platforms. Uh, how do you spell Trivago? Uh, Trivago is, you know, booking holdings, reduced its spend in Trivago. Um, the company is suffering. They're relying on just a couple of uh, major advertisers. And you say that some of the players that you're working with are cooperating and some aren't. So translate that for us. What does that mean? I'm so tempted to ask which word's the hard one. Um, <laughs> look, I am an affable guy. <laughs> and people in our company are nice people. <laughs> we very much so always want to be cooperative with everybody. That's the way we've built our company, by being pleasant and good cooperating people. But if somebody doesn't want to be cooperative with us, if somebody wants to force us to do things that are first bad for our customers, bad for the customer, it's then it's very unfair to us. We'll say, okay, you're allowed to do what you want to do. That's fine. We'll just take our business elsewhere. If I go to a restaurant and they give me crappy service and the food sucks and is too overpriced, I'm not going back. It's that simple. Now, if they provide good food, good service, reasonable price, I'll eat there all the time. That's the answer. Is there any meta search platform that you can tell us is serving good food? I don't believe <laughs> I don't believe it's appropriate to bring out anybody's particular bad meals. I see. I remember asking Dara from Expedia if Airbnb is going to uh, eat his lunch, and he said he's very well fed. So with that transition, let's talk about Airbnb and alternative accommodations. That's a good open table, actually. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about that, too. Um, so it's pretty, pretty much of an open secret that probably the one company that Airbnb fears most might be uh, Booking.com. Uh, you've been making a big push in alternative accommodations. So they're a private company. They might do an IPO soon. Um, do you have any more clarity into who's winning this game at this point? No, I don't know. Well, a couple of things. One, I don't believe in this who's winning. Again, this idea we bring long-term business into short-term sports events. Who's winning? What's the score? Who's up? Who's down? Not the way to do things. This whole idea of alternative accommodations is an enormous opportunity for so many people to have a great business and provide a great service that really, you know, it existed before there was a digitalization, but it wasn't very efficient, it was very hard. When you wanted to get the condo on the beach or you wanted a place to go skiing, you want to get an actual house, it was complicated and hard, going back and forth, looking for how do I find the right one. Now it's much easier and everybody is better off because of this. Um, we believe that it's important to provide all the accommodations to our customers and we think we have a real winning, winning uh, model. Because when people come to us, they can see everything right up front, look at the reviews, look at the, uh, it's gonna, what it's gonna cost them and it's all of it on booking.com, instantly, instantly confirmable, so there's not the back and forth, back and forth, and the price you see when you first came on, that's the price. You're not gonna get hit with a you know, traveler's fee at the end or a cleaning fee. It's a different model that we believe is better. Which brings me to my next question. 
-hmm. So Airbnb announced, I think it was yesterday, that they have a deal with a uh, boutique hotel association in Thailand. Uh, they're going to be putting those hotels on uh, the Airbnb platform. Now, Airbnb charges hotels uh, and hosts, you know, roughly 3 to 5 percent. For argument's sake, you might charge them you know, 15% or maybe for smaller hotels, more than that, I don't know. Um, so won't this put pressure on your commission levels at some point? Uh, won't hotels start flocking to Airbnb instead of booking.com? So there are a couple ways to think about this, and, and I don't want to get into a math game here about the fact that you hit, uh, you ask the supplier to pay one certain percent, and then you hit the consumer at the end with the travel fee at the end of the print, and it ends up being the same amount of money being taken out of the uh, price that was paid by the consumer at the end of the day, and you end up kind of in the same place. The more important thing actually is to look at the demand side, because we believe we are one of the lowest uh, commission uh, takers in the market, really do. And when, you, when we go and talk to some of our partners uh, or suppliers and we say, gee, you're handing out 25, 30, 35, 40 percent to X, Y, or Z wholesalers, whatever. Why are you doing that? We're charging much, much less. Why don't you just give us all the business? And they're like, because we're not 100 percent filled. And so it's better to give 40% to that guy over there who gets that person to fill up because the marginal cost of us filling that bed is significantly lower than the 60% revenue we got to keep. If you have demand, when you have demand, suppliers will want to do business with you. We believe we are providing a very fair price, building a good, long-term, friendly relationship. And I don't worry too much about somebody trying to do some sort of game. Well, we'll charge 3% here, we'll charge 15% there. We're not going to worry about that. Does it, ended up, does it end up meaning anything uh, regarding the, the price that the end consumer eventually pays, those two different models? Price is so critical. Consumers, when you see the exact same product and one is cheaper, generally, generally that's the one they would prefer to buy from. So being able to provide the lowest price is very important. But it's not the only thing, by the way. Many times, convenience matters. Customer service matters. The fact that we do everything in 40-something languages, when you have a problem, maybe you speak a second language. Let's say English is your second language, and you can get by on it. But you happen to speak Catalan as your primary language, and you, and you got customer service in Catalan, you know, maybe you'll, you would spend a little bit more because that makes it so much more convenient, easy if something were to go wrong. That's one of the things. And 20, having that 47 languages 24-7. So how's the regulatory environment shaping up with alternative accommodations? Airbnb recently uh, sued New York City um, over the requirement that they have to ha share host information with New York City. Are you guys sharing that kind of host information uh, with New York? We wait, you know, the, the law is not effective yet. You know that, right? It's, I think it comes whenever, January 1, maybe, I, don't, I don't remember that. It's not, it's not in place yet. And there is a lawsuit going on right now. And so here's our philosophy on all areas in the world of regulation. We will lobby. We will try and do what we think is best for the industry and for customers and partners, what we think is the best way to. And we will talk with all the people in government and try and do that. We are cognizant, though, that it's important to do what the regulations are. We believe in following the laws. We do not go around and just thumbing our noses and say, yeah, we know it's a democratic process there, and I know you elected those people, and those people put the law in there, but you know, eh, we don't like that law because we're whatever. We're digital, so we don't have to obey the law. Wrong. That's not the way to do it. Work to get the laws the way you want them. Do what you can. But when the law comes out, you follow the law. It's that simple. I believe that our business in the long run is better off by being cooperative and understanding all of the stakeholders, all of them. And who are stakeholders? Stakeholders are not only our customers, our shareholders, our employees, the regulators, and the people who live in the neighborhood. And you have to take them all into account when you're trying to be a good corporate citizen. 
Let's talk experiences, AKA tours and activities. Um, I think about a year ago, you guys, uh, maybe it was longer ago, you started um, putting uh, a link to kayak flights on uh, booking.com, and I thought that was a signal that um, you know, you, you'd be selling flights by now. But it seems like... We do sell flights, you know. Priceline sells a lot of flights. Right. Uh, I was talking about booking.com. Kayak sells a lot of flights. Yeah, but the, it's meta search mostly. Okay. Uh. Anyway. It seems like... Uh, We're still testing on booking, too, you know. Okay. So wh when are we going to see it? You see it right... We're testing right now. Okay. We're testing. Remember the last question about testing? We test, we test, we test. Anyway, you're going towards, you know, more full service. Seems to be being carried out in the realm of experiences. You're doing ground transport. You're doing tours and activities. Interestingly, you're doing, um, for some travelers, shopping, as in... Louis Vuitton discounts. Did you get yours yet? Your Louis I have Vuitton? not gotten mine yet. Hermes. I don't. You know, my, my I'm looking. Maybe my wife took it. So, what's your um, what, what's your view ab about that space? Um, we're we're going to talk to TripAdvisor Steve Kaufer later. L later, and he he talks about um, experiences in the context of the hotel business uh, two decades ago. So, how how big do you think this can become? And and um, and how are you going to scale it up? So, so I don't like the term full service so much. Uh, and it's, uh, we want to try and build this holistic system that really makes the end-to-end -end trip a wonderful experience. Now, when you go traveling, you don't go to a hotel to sit in the hotel. Nobody does that. You know, you go to the hotel to have a little, maybe some things there, but you want to experience where you're going around, what you're going to do. So we need to build a system, a platform, using all the data that we have about people and all the things they've told us, and using all the technology, all this wonderful AI, all the machine learning that we're getting, so we can come up with that perfect personalized, personalized type experience and making it so much easier for the person. And on top of that, layer on top of that, the frictionless. How many people here use Uber? Raise a hand, please. Okay, isn't that wonderful, easy? Ba -ba -ba, in the car, ba -ba -ba, out the car. You don't look for your cash. You don't think, how much should I tip or not? Is it even a button? It's wonderful right now. Think about your last time you were in Vegas in a hotel and you checked in and how long did it take you to check? How long was that line? It made the TSA line look short. <laughs> and you're thinking, why is this? They have all the data. I I booked it, they know who I am, they got the credit card, everything, why is it? And then you want to check out. And you're like, why do I have to wait to check out? Why? And some people say, I don't check, I just leave. And I just... So that's just the start. There's so many other things that there's still so much friction in this travel experience. And I'll tell you, I'm gonna waste time to tell you this wonderful thing that we just had and it boosts my brand and I'm going, but this is why I'm here, it's to boost the brand. So my wife, and my kids, we went to um, Europe in the summer in August, and we went on a bike trip thing, and we end up at Salzburg, and my wife made the bookings, and she did appropriately use booking.com. I thanked her for doing that. It was very important that she does that. Um, she does that. And she got an email after we booked about, don't forget about all the, you know, whatever great things to do in Salzburg from booking.com, and she has the app. We arrive in Salzburg, and there, another message about things to do. And we're looking, we're gonna go see this, there's a castle up at the top of the mountain thing, if you've been in Salzburg, you know what I'm talking about. And um, right there, on the app, click, QR code comes up. We don't have to wait in line to get onto the funicular to go up the mountain, we just put it up, and it was cheaper, because booking.com got a good deal. So it's cheaper, faster, easier. All you did was show this, you know, I got the other Americans in the long line, they're looking for their euros, trying to figure out how much this is in dollars and all that, and we're just going right up. We want to do that everywhere. We're running out of time. Before we get to audience questions, I got to ask you about China. Uh, you just mentioned Uber. Uh, you're a big investor in uh, Didi, the ride-sharing company in China, $500 million. Yep. You invested $450 million in Meituan. Yep. You're a big minority investor in C-Trip. Yep. Um, some of these investments are larger than the acquisitions much larger than the acquisitions you made this year of uh, Fair Harbor and um, hotels yeah. combined. China's a big place. 
big focus for you. So what's, what's the uh, DD? Explain that. Why, why invest in a ride-sharing company? So China is an incredible opportunity for everybody. I always talk about being the, the locomotive that's pulling the travel train. Um, and we need to be, we need to have a, a presence there to do well there. We've been there for a long time. We have almost 1,000 employees there. We have, I don't remember how many, 12, 14 offices. I'm not sure right now how many we have. We do a lot of business there. With our own brand, great. We also have partners, C-Trip, big investment there. We supply outbound uh, inventory to them. We work together with inbound. We do all sorts of things together there. Metuan, Metuan, very big, very fast growing company. Just went public a couple days ago there. Uh, things around a 50 to $60 billion valuation right now there. They have many different things they do. One of them is travel. We're working with them. We'll have our, our, our own business and Didi also enormous. It's like Uber of China. There's a lot more rides than Uber does, by the way. Um, everybody knows Didi. So we thought, OK, let's think about this. We want to improve our brand. Didi has a heck of a lot of people. Let's work together in something because we also know every single one of our customers who comes to China does not drive a car in China. That doesn't happen. They got to get around somehow on the ground. What are they going to use? Didi. Now, until recently, by the way, Didi only had a Chinese app. Kind of hard for most of the people who go to China to use it. Uh, recently, now they have an English language one. But still, we have a lot of customers. English isn't their language, right? So what we're done is this deal is so wonderful. One, our customers, they go onto the booking.com or the Agoda uh, uh, app, and you'll be able to get that ground transportation from Didi on our app in the language that they were doing the work with booking or Agoda. Really good, nice, seamless, frictionless thing. Second thing is we're going to work with them so we can help make sure all those Didi customers know about Booking.com and Agoda, you need a place to stay, that's where you can go and get a great deal, great service in Chinese. And the third thing is, and I always, always think about this too, we want to make some money on the investment too. Right. And you made a lot of money on C-Trip, I believe. And we made a lot of, and that's one, you know, we invested right. at a $30 billion valuation a year ago, and internally it's 50 to 60. Um, it's okay. I want to get to a couple of audience questions. One of the changes you made was uh, in how the You've always siloed the brands and let, it, let them uh, compete and, you know, they have talented teams, let them do their thing. So, uh, for example, you've, you've changed some of that. So, for example, uh, open table, uh, the open table leadership now reports to the kayak leadership. Mm -hmm. So the question is, why has open tables marketing and product been consolidated under kayak? It doesn't seem like you're taking good advantage of open tables power. Why not? Um... We have not done everything I wanted to do when we did the deal with Open Table yet. We are making substantial progress, and I've seen some stuff, which unfortunately I can't talk about here, but they'll roll out in the not so distant future that I think are going to be pretty nifty. But I'll talk a little bit about the concepts of things that I've always talked about, and it goes back to this idea of all the experiences. When I go traveling in a city, I don't generally know what those restaurants are, which ones I should use or not. And absolutely, we should be able to do something between the power of Open Table, the power of our hotel brands, and be able to do it so it's better for the customer. When I, a person, goes, uh, when I go to London and I'm staying in a fancy hotel in Mayfair, Lots of hotel, lots of restaurants there would like to get my business because they know he's staying at an expensive Mayfair hotel. He's probably going to buy an expensive bottle of wine. We need to do a better job of combining these things so that I, person traveling, gets these great offers because those restaurants want me. So whether it's a, whether a free uh, dessert or maybe just a special, a better table, who knows what. But be able to do that so, again, the customer's better off. The restaurant has a good way to reach out to valuable customers. Everybody wins. We need to do that. Glenn, I will get no free dessert unless we get off stage now because we're out of time. All right. So thank you. Thank you.